Okay. All right. Uh, welcome to the war room. And I've got my darling mother with me tonight. And as advertised, we said we would be talking about family secrets. And God has secrets and families have secrets. But before we begin our conversation and uh, this exciting time together, we're going to pray together. So let's go ahead and pray together. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you for this time together. Thank you for your word. Thank you that you lead and you guide us. Thank you for every person that is watching and will watch us tonight, that their lives will be touched and healed by your presence and your power, because you always say to us, that like mom says, nothing is impossible with God. Amen. 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 So mom, tell me how that came to you. Nothing is impossible. When you got up and sang that, something happened and changed in the atmosphere in the church. What was it that changed that or brought that to you? Well, Wendy, uh, you know, your father was already 60 when he was going to build the dome. And I was praying and I said to the Lord, Lord, is this your will to build this huge place of over 5,000 people? We don't have the money. And um, what must we do? And the Lord said three things to me. He said three things. It's my church. It's my people. And it's my money. Honor me and I'll provide for you. Beautiful. And, and so I told that to dad because the Lord told me to write it down and never to forget it. And I told dad and he said, come on, we're going to get together and we're going to pray. And we prayed. And then the Lord gave me that scripture that with God, nothing is impossible. Yes. And you you know, before that, I suffered terribly from depression because I believed the lie of the devil. And then the Lord healed me. Once I'd heard the word of faith and understood what faith was in Hebrews 11, you know, faith is now the things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And then it came to me because me and dad had been fighting. You know, Saturday nights is always a wonderful time when the devil comes and knocks at our door. Because tomorrow secret. we got to, <laughs> well. Some people think the pastors never fight, that everything's always wonderful. And Saturday nights, you have no pressure for Sunday. Well, this was before the Lord healed me. Yes. And um, so I told your father, I said to him, listen. The Lord listens to you. You're a wonderful man. You're a wonderful father. You're a wonderful pastor, but I'm out of here. And I'm packing my bags tonight, and I'm leaving. And he stood by the door in the bedroom, and he said, over my dead body, will you leave this house? So I said, well, I don't care what you're saying. I'm out of here because... God loves you and he hears you and you're a wonderful man and a wonderful father and I'm out of here. Well, anyway, he went into the dressing, the little dressing room that we had and he went to pray. And then uh, Dorothy brought and her husband gave us a little tape. So I thought, well, let me listen to this tape. And it was Kenneth Hagen preaching yes. on that scripture in, in Hebrews 11 verse 1. And Wendy, it was like a light, but just shone so bright. And I could believe that God could hear me and I could believe the impossible. So mm -hmm. now I start shouting at your father, Fred, come and listen. Come and listen what God's saying, Fred. Fred, the poor guy, he opens the door and he looks, his, you know, have the brown eyes he had. He's got these huge big eyes and he says, What's going on now in the room? I said, God's just talked to me and said to me that I can believe him. And I can believe him. If I can have those eyes of faith, I can believe him for anything. Praise and God. then the Lord, then I devoured the Bible. I started to read the New Testament from Matthew to Revelation. And I read it and I read it and I read it and I read it over and over again. And, um, and from then onwards, God started to open the scriptures to me or things would come to me. And uh, from then onwards, I would be with your father and I would say to him, come on, 
we can believe God together. And then when the Lord gave me that scripture, when the angel said to Mary, with God, nothing is impossible. And we had learned that song. So when we sang it on a Sunday morning, I was believing God. Well, we were believing God for funds to come in. I mean, that roof at that time cost about four or five million. And I mean, where were we going I to get five the, the million biggest, from? The biggest aluminium dome in the Southern Hemisphere, I think. Yeah, at that was. time, at yeah. that time it was. And so every time we sang that on a Sunday, your dad and I were believing God, you know. And Margaret Chapman was our bookkeeper at that time. And then when there was no fun, she would come into my office and she'd say, don't tell Pastor Fred, but pray with me because there's no money. And I said, okay, well, how much would we need? You know, and then she'd tell me the amount and we'd hold hands and then Margaret and I, we'd pray. And then she'd come in and often say, you can't believe it. Somebody just wrote this check for so-and-so. This person just gave us a million rand for the dome you know and so God started to show me you know how his word actually because you know the Bible says that each one of us have the spirit of faith in us yes. and if you don't know what God says and you don't know what the word says then how are you going to believe the Lord you know and so our lives changed our, our perception and our marriage changed my attitude to you Kids change because you were out up to nonsense, and Llewellyn was up to nonsense, and Linda was up to nonsense, you know, thinking that the world's got more to offer you than the church. Well, you know, I mean, it was the woman who were the problem, you know, and the men were all fine, but it was the woman and, and all the rest of it. But anyway, you know, I started to believe God because I remember when you were on drugs and that, and I uh, was praying for you, but I wasn't praying like in faith. When you used to come, then I used to be horrible to you and say ugly things to you and all that. And the Lord said I don't to even me, don't, remember that. Well, then the Lord said to me, don't do that. You love her. Tell her how much you love her and how much Jesus loves her. And then when I started to change my attitude, the Lord started to change your heart, you know. And um, so that's how it came to me, you know. And then I used to, your father said to me, because I would say to him that there was a one of our pastors and we were taking communion and we were still in the old Alhambra. And uh, your father looked at me and there was one of the pastors doing communion. And your father said to me, you see that man there at the table? He'll never, ever leave me. He'll stay with me. And as dad said that, I looked at him. And when he hear his shoes were walking down the aisle out of the front door of that old Alhambra, I said to your father on the platform, I said, hey, next week this guy's going to hand in his resignation. He's leaving. Your father said, I told you he's going to be, he's the faithful. I said, he can't be because I just saw his shoes walking out the aisle and going out the front door. And for sure, the next week, he and his wife handed in the resignation and they were gone. So that was a prophetic, that would be termed a prophetic unction, really, and a gift of faith that would come to you when you sing, nothing is impossible, and the Lord would provide. It was God's faith, because the Bible says, have the God kind of faith. It's not yeah. our faith. It's it's faith in God. It's faith in God's word. It's not faith in our own faith or faith in ourselves. You know, sometimes yeah. people say, if you think more, if you, you know, think better Positive. about yourself, yes, think yeah. positively, you can be better. But it's not, it's having the faith of God. So from a uh, a, a young child, did you have that sort of sense of intuition? No. It I, had a dream. I had a dream when I was about 11. And I dreamed because, you know, we stayed in Peter Maritzburg at that time. And my dad used to bring us like once a month, drive down to Durban and we used to go to the beach. And in my dream, I dreamed I was at the beach. And when I looked up into the sky, this huge big hook came out of the sky. And 
And I climbed on it in my dream. I saw myself climbing on it. And it pulled me up into the sky. And when I got in the sky, there was this huge long passage. And I started to walk down the passage. It was just doors on one side, doors on the other side. And now I don't know where to go in my dream. I'm thinking, which door do I take? And then I turned to my left hand. And I was going to go to this door and a voice said to me, your choices are the most important thing in your life. And I mm. woke up. And that was like the first experience as a, as a young person having that, you know, that choices are the most important thing when you're young. So you, you came to the Lord when and made a decision for the Lord. I think you said you were baptized yeah. with... When you four. Were four. I was four when I gave my heart to the Lord. I still even remember what I was dressed in. Really, Mom? You know, yeah. I had this, my mother had made this little Scottish skirt and I had a red jersey on. And when he asked who wants to give the heart to Jesus, I got up and I walked down the aisle and said, I do. Wow. And that's when I gave my heart to the Lord. And then we had special meetings and I was about seven. And I got filled with the Holy Spirit. But that was it. I just talked in tongues. You know, it wasn't like a supernatural experience. But um, we were at a young people's meeting, but it was going to be a prayer meeting when I was started to go out with your father. And I was kneeling in the front row and the pastor's wife was in the second row. And uh, while I, I wasn't really even praying because I didn't know how to pray. And as I was speaking to the Lord, I thought the Holy Spirit came and this unusual experience in the pit of my stomach. And I was going, oh, oh, and I thought, and I've got my hands over my mouth because here's the pastor's wife in the next row. And what will she think of me and all the rest of it? So. With the Holy Spirit, I've had different experiences of supernatural experiences. And then I would tell your father things, and then he would say to me, you know what, you've got a real spirit of superstition. Oh, and I was so brokenhearted. So I fasted a day, and I, I was praying. And I said to the Lord, oh, Lord, take this away from me, because if this is a devil or whatever it is, just take it away from me. I don't want to know. I don't want to know anything. And the Lord said to me, he said, you're looking after my people. Mm. And if I've given you the authority, you need to look after my sheep. And if I show you to protect them, then you need to protect them. That's good, Mom. And so, I mean, of course, you had four children. There's, I was the eldest, and then... Um, Lou. Llewellyn and then Linda was the third one and then of course Joy is the youngest out of the four of us I think Llewellyn has been the one to have that accurate he can see things you know we always say if if Lou said it it's going to happen and you know it, it, sometimes it's it's a it's, did did something happen to him as a as a child that you can say? Because out of the four of us, he has been the most, well, and is still the most. The thing sensitive. that I can remember was that one night, me and Dad, had, Dad, had, you know, I always had to go with him to go and visit the the, the people at the church, and and he, they used to love Dad to come and lie in bed and tell them, you know, the stories he used to tell them of what's about the green elf and. What was it, elves or what the, was the, it? They he used to tell us goblin stories. Goblin stories. Yeah. Make, up, make up stories about the goblins and the real yeah. goblin would run and yeah. take the other yeah. one's shoes and whatever. Yeah. And uh, so as we walked in, Llewellyn said, Dad, Dad. And then Fred still said, but you're supposed to be asleep. Why aren't you asleep? And so when he went into the room, he says to your father, the devil was here and he walked right in my mouth. And your father said, you're talking nonsense. But he had How such a high he, 
must have been about five or six. And he said the devil walked in his mouth. Yeah, but he had such a high fever, you know. He was really, really sick. And then dad prayed for him and anointed him with oil and like the normal procedure would be in the family, you know. And, um, and dad prayed for him. And then, you know, with us being in the church in Malvern for so many years, like we were there for 25 years building that church. And um, so I called the doctor and he always used to say, Mrs. Roberts, if you called, then I know it's an emergency because, you know, we never were visiting the doctor every five minutes because dad would pray and, you know, that would be it. And um, so I phoned the doctor and uh, I went the next morning and Llewellyn's fever was absolutely fine. Well, it and was so, gone. And, he was fine. And I think you told me that he had an encounter where he said he saw a man like the, the man, like the sheets on the, on the, on the clothes line. Oh, yeah. Um, and then you said you hasn't got sores in his hand. He held your hand and said he hasn't got you haven't got sores in your hand like he had. Yeah, I remember that, but now I've forgotten that story. Okay. Yeah. Well, you know, um, like I told you, I started to absolutely devour God's word, and and then I read um, one of uh, Maxwell White, one of Maxwell White's book on the power of the blood of Jesus and uh, Joy Bells had got measles very badly and I would have to feed her with a teaspoon with a little bit of water so she was taking some moisture in her you know so when she was in a church on the Sunday night I told the people Joy Bells is very very ill and um, I must go home because, you know, we had to stand up at the door and shake everybody's hand and say good night. And uh, I went home and um, Joy Bells was sleeping in our bed. And so dad went and slept in the room with, with uh, Llewellyn. And in the middle of the night, I was just laying my hand on Joy's tummy and I was just pleading the blood. And as I was pleading the blood over her, here this angel stood by the bed right next to her. And, you know, you try to explain what it's like, what it looks like, but you can't. You know, all I can say is when you have an electric globe, that reflection it has inside it, that's what the head of the angel looked like. So now I was so excited about this. And your father being in the other room. So I got out and I walked around at the back of this angel and I went and told your father. I said, Fred, you better come and look. There's an angel in the room here. Oh, man, he said, there's no angel. I said, Fred, I'm telling you this. There's a being that's been standing by Joy Bells as I prayed for her. So he comes in, he puts the light on, and he says, look, there's nothing here. So... Off he goes back to bed in the other room. I put the light off and I just kept praying for her. And, the, and this angel came again, stood by the bed. And um, I ran and I told your father, I said, there is one here. He's come back again and he's touching joy bells. And uh, so your father came and he said, look, there's nothing here in the room. But the next day, joy bells was absolutely perfect. No measles. No, nothing. She went to school the next day. And uh, the people at the church said, but you told us that she was so sick with measles and look at her running around the church garden now. And so then I replied and told them about this book that I read uh, about Mac. Uh, blood. Yeah. And uh, the power of the blood of Jesus, you know, because he was telling the story about the this little girl, when he was in the East, how he prayed for her and the power of the blood. So, you know, Wendy, um, when you uh, have an encounter with the Lord, like when we were going through a hard time in the ministry and I was very, very upset. I was, and 
it was like, for me, it was like early morning. And you know what our bedroom is like, you know, the two chairs, dad would sit on the one and the table between us for our coffee in the morning and that. And I woke up and Jesus was sitting in my chair. And I got out of bed, in, I don't know if it was a dream or a vision or what, but I got out of bed and, and Jesus was laughing. He had his head back and he was laughing. And I put my hand over my mouth and I said, Jesus, I didn't know you laughed like that. And the reply I got was the joy of the Lord is the strength of his people. Yeah. You know, it, it, I mean, you're not looking for this. You know, it's not like, well, I'm voting, hoping Jesus will turn up. I've never thought like that. You know, but. That's what happens. And then I realized, you know, God will give your husband a spiritual gift, but then he'll give the wife a, a spiritual gift as well because it's his church and he will have um, us look after his people the best we can, you know. Yes, yes, yes. So in terms of, you know, we were talking a little bit earlier about how that Lou has like that, prophetic unction on him did did you know that was it because I mean your faith really had to work hard because the devil came against him with everything that he could to stop him being born again do you think that was because of the the gift you know because when he breaches it sounds like dad you know the unction and anointing <laughs> is there like dad yeah. you know well, you know, the experience I had, we were there at your house in Florida. And Llewellyn phoned and said, Dad, I'm, I'm, at, I'm at the flat I'm, and I've given my heart to Jesus. And I said to your father, oh, my God, do you think we'll have any furniture left when we get there? Because he used to steal everything. And your father said, no, man, come on. He said he's given his heart to Jesus. And I said, Fred, you know how many times he said that already? But anyway, we came home and we could see he, he would lie on his face before the Lord day and day. And he would just listen to Brother Hagen's word on faith and just listen to those tapes in those early years. And, um, and then Dad and I were sitting in the lounge and we were watching a video of um, Kenneth Hagen. And as I was sitting there, here a vision came in front of me of Lou preaching in the old Alhambra. And, um, and as I looked, you know, it was like a yeah. curtain. As I pulled it away, here's Llewellyn, but he's laying hands on the sick and he's crying, you know, as he's laying his hands on the people and all that. And so I said to your father, I've just seen a vision of Llewellyn being the pastor at the old Alhambra. He says to me, sweetheart, I know that you've been praying for him and all that. I said, but I've just seen it. I saw it now. I saw him preaching there in the old Alhambra. And, and when he was praying for the people, his nose was running all over as well. His compassion was so great for the people, you know. So, so when you know, hear him, when you hear him preach, what do you hear? Do you hear Dad? A lot, a lot of his mannerisms now. He's getting older. He's like his father. You know, all the things I shouldn't eat today. I got donuts, fresh donuts. This morning, I got, I got little tarts with. Um, I've forgotten what's in the middle of them now. And I said, Lou, you can't bring any more sweets and everything. Now, your father used to show love by giving. You know, he wasn't this kind of person that puts his arms around you and tells you how beautiful you are and wonderful you are. He would always be buying something or bringing something. Like Fridays, every Friday, I'd get a big bunch of roses. He'd bring me roses. And, you know, and I see Lou's exactly the same. There's so much 
likeness of him as he's growing older now. That's like your father. And and when he preaches in his mannerism, do you do you see and hear that sort of healing anointing? Because I know that he's coming and you've been so sick. Oh yeah, I just had a miracle about two weeks ago, I think. I started this terrible pain in, in, in my stomach. And, you know, I've had that operation and they haven't given me a good report. And they told me if I have that pain, I must go straight away to the specialist and all that. And uh, and here I'm sitting there and I've got this terrible pain and the devil, wah, wah, wah. And uh, I said, devil, I rebuke you because that same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead, it's quickening this old mortal body. And then Lou came. And so I told him, I said, oh, my boy, I've got such a pain in my tummy. Oh, he said, come on and put his hand on my tummy and prayed for me. Wendy, in a half an hour, that pain was gone, and I never had that pain again, gone. So you see that same healing anointing that was on Dad? Yeah, you know, you like your dad would preach. And then all of a sudden, he'd start walking down the stairs, you know, from the platform. And then I would be sitting next to Pastor Johnny and I'd say, oh, Johnny, you better watch it this morning. The power of God is going to hit these people. As he would come down those stairs, the Holy Spirit would come and he would pray for the sick, Wendy. It would be amazing. I see the same with Lou. You know, and I think all, your, all my children, you know, they're, I don't know where, where the scripture is, where how the, the, the Bible says the Lord will bless you and the Lord will make his face to shine upon you and he'll bless your children and he'll bless your children's children and he'll bless you for a thousand generations. Thousand. You know, when I see how God is blessing my grandchildren and my great-grandchildren, you know, and when you see the word of God, it's so amazing. You know, and you see the promises of God fulfilled in your own family. You know, it's to me, it's wonderful. Because I remember when we were still living in Dale Road behind the, the university, and I was watching a video. Dad was at church, I was watching a video. And the man was preaching about when Jesus, the disciples had gone out to fish and there was no fish. And then he told them, get to the other side of the boat. And then they had such a big load of fish, you know. And um, Jesus said to, the, uh, to Peter, lovest thou me more than these? And that's what that preacher was preaching about. Lovest thou me more than these? And uh, I was sitting there. And I, think, I was thinking to myself now, what do, what do I have that I love, the, I love more than love the Lord? And then I thought to myself, you know, if Dad passed away, the only thing, I, a little bit of money I would have would be we'd sell the house because we never owned it. We'd sell the house. No, we did own it, sorry. We sell the house, and then whatever profit we'd make, that would be the money I'd have to live on. And then the scripture came to me, lovest thou me more than thee. And then I thought, well, Lord, I love you more than that little bit of money that I'd get, you know. Mm -hmm. and, the, and then I said, well, Lord, you can have this house. So when your father came home from the office, I said to him, we, we've just sold the house. So he looks at me and says, what do you mean? I said, well, I just told the Lord he can have this house and we'll put it up for sale tomorrow. He looks at me, he said, and then where will we live? I said, I don't know. I don't know what we'll do. So anyway, we put it on the market. We sold. And then the church bought a little flat there in Ridge Road, remember? Yes, up on the 10th floor. Yeah. And it was a church apartment. And we'd stayed there about 10 years because Dad was busy building the dome. And um, Dad would, was studying. He said, 
these walls aren't mine. The floor's not mine. I said, when we live happy here, it's easy to church, new building. And I said, the lamb is just down the road. I said, it's fine. I'm happy here. And um, so, and I said, well, if we want to swim, we can just go down there to John and Joy. They got a swimming pool. We can go and swim there. So your father said, no, man, it's not mine. This is not mine. That's not mine. Nothing's mine. And he said, we're going to believe the Lord for us. Well, we opened the dome. And then Pastor Nicholas Amzameli, he came to us after church. And he said, can't we have a Thanksgiving service next Saturday? What an incredible so said, man. Yes. What an incredible yeah. man he was, hey, Mom? Yeah. Him and Doris. And he's, yeah. And he said to Dad, you know what? You built a church, but you didn't build it for black people. You put lovely seats in, and everything you put in there was all lovely. And and so we just want to say thank you to the Lord for, for, for us being part of you building this place. And we can all come here because it was mainly apartheid years, remember? And uh, so... The next Saturday, we're all there, and, and the African people are dancing. You know how lovely they dance, and they're singing, and, and all the rest of it. And then Fred said to Pastor Mzameli, well, why don't you take the offering up this morning? You know, because it was you, to, you suggested just saying thank you to the Lord. And what he did, he started to talk the word and all that, and, and then he he turned to post to dad and he said, um, I've got a check for you. So dad said, you mean for me or for the church? He said, no, for you. And it was a million rand. Wow. He says, we're going to buy you the best house you ever had. And now, wow. you know, for me, if the money's not in the but bank. Just, just to recap, mom, Pastor Nicholas and dad went back. 20 years, I think you'd been friends with oh, him. Yeah, when we had been had an, itinerant, had an itinerant ministry, and then he'd come and sit with dad and pray with dad at the house. I can remember him and Pastor Ezra coming and dad really speaking to him and telling him that he must. Because he was trained. going around singing, playing a guitar. Yes. Remember? And dad said to him one day, because he came to Bible school, and dad said to him, are you going to spend the rest of your life going from church to church playing your guitar? So he looked at dad and he said, well, what do you mean? And Fundi said, I'm going to, you know. So dad says, well, come on, let's build a church at Kwamashu. And, and he looked at dad. He said, do you think we can do it? Dad said, of course we can do it. We can trust God for an old building. We can go and look for a building and fix it up and start a church. Otherwise, you're going to go around singing with your guitar for the rest of your life. Well, you know, they found a building. We put a new roof on it and we fixed it all up. And the it's Marshall a Christian Center. Yeah. And, and, and they've got a lot to, of... He used to love to have one of Dad's jackets or whatever, like all yeah, of us Dad did, gave him because we could feel seven, the anointing. Yes. Dad gave him suits for 17 years. Dad suits. Dad and it wasn't that Nicholas could, couldn't afford them. He just wanted Dad's clothes. Well, Dad used to give them to him, you know, like he'd come and visit. And then Dad would say to him, hey, Nicholas, I've got something for you. And Dad would bring one of his suits out and would they, they would fit him just exactly right, you know. And, yeah. and then, like, after 17 years, Pastor Nicholas came and he said, look, and Fundis, I'm not a baby anymore that you got to buy me suits. I can buy my own suits now. And uh, Shane, he always, you know, came to see us. And like when dad was so sick, he would come and pray with dad and all that. Yeah. So, you know, it's wonderful. wonderful God too. puts people in your lives. And then you bought, you bought the house in Westville. It was a beautiful home with Yeah, it had a tennis in court. It. You know, like you go and visit and there would be, we'd visit different people and they'd have a tennis court and a swimming pool. And then I would say to dad, oh, it would be so nice if we could have that for the children, you know. Dad would say, oh, yeah. And this house 
had a tennis court, it had a jacuzzi, it had a swimming pool, it had a steam room, it had everything. And then the, the, the ladies came in and they said, no, we're going to put the best curtains in and they made curtains. And, and then Lois, you know, came and painted all the little angels on the mm. ceiling for me. And I mean, they put a new kitchen in the house. I mean, they did everything. And then all the, the Zulu ladies came one morning where I had a prayer meeting there and they came and they sang. Oh, it was so wonderful when they came and they sang all in every room. Then they went upstairs. They sang in the rooms there, all down the passages, and they sang, sang thank you to the Lord, you know. And, and that's why we could live where we are today because of the giving of the people in those early years, you know. And so your vision of seeing Llewellyn preach, you know, it was the furthest thing from what oh, reality yeah. was. But seeing him preach like that has been fulfilled. So, you know, I mean, we want to encourage moms and dads parents. and yes. parents that God can do the impossible for their well, children. Well, you know, he gave... he. The Lord gave the, the, the scripture to say that he will bless us. He'll bless our children. He'll bless our grandchildren. He'll bless our great-grandchildren to a thousand generations. Yeah. So we must rather see the gift that our children have and encourage them, you know, because Proverbs 14.1 says, A wise woman builds her house, but a, but a, a foolish Gosh. woman pulls it down with her own hands. And I believe it's the words that come out of our mouth that we can either build up our husbands or we can destroy them and we can build our children up or we can destroy them by our mouth. And with our mouths, we can trust God for the impossible. You know, yeah. the people that are watching, maybe they're trusting God for their children. Perhaps they're trusting God for a home and a car. God, God cares about us. You know, he said that if he looks after the little sparrows and he looks after the lilies of the field, how much more won't he? How much more? Yes. I mean, you know, you take that word more. But, you know, it's not how much you can get out the ministry. It's how much you can give. You know, when the church would be in need and we had a motor car, dad would sell the motor car and then the money that we'd have over, instead of getting another car, he would put it where the need was in the church. So it was never like, well, I'll take a special offering. I know somebody gave me in those early years a, a micro oven, you know, micro oven. And I was telling Fred's brother, I said, oh, it was so wonderful, you know. The Lord gave, us, gave me such a surprise to give me a wonderful microwave. So he said, oh, yeah, man, you people just stand up on the platform there and you tell people, you know, oh, I want a microwave or I need this or I need that. I said, don't insult me. Don't insult me to tell me that I will get up in my, in my people in my church and tell them, I need this and, and you must supply it. I think it's such an insult to them. So but if we can teach them the word, if we can teach and insult, instill in them that with God, nothing is impossible. And they can believe God for that, you know, because it's what we see by faith. It's not what we say with our mouth. Because um, Hebrews 11 says, it's the things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. You haven't seen them, but you've got the evidence because of the promises of God. So before we, we go on, maybe you can just take a moment and pray for families right now. Pray for people that are trusting God for miracles in their lives, things that they think are impossible, but what... What's not possible with man is possible with God. So won't you just We've already and... lost the fight if we say it's impossible. Wow. You know, if we if we're saying, you know, I've got to believe God for this and, and all that. 
But he gives it to us when we can handle it. You know, we don't give our kids a car when they're only 12 or 13. You don't know how to handle what you've got. Yeah. And we can't pray for stuff that we can't handle ourselves. You know, if you can't, if you're a pastor in a church and you can't handle a thousand rand, you think God's going to give you a million. He knows you can't handle a, a thousand. You can't handle a thousand. You can't be responsible for a thousand. He's not going to give you more money than that. Yeah. And so if we say it looks impossible, there's nothing impossible. It's possible. Look, I'm going to be 88 next month. I'm nearly 100, oh. man. 12 more <laughs> years and I'm 100. And I mean, all I've seen since uh, the word of faith came to me is I've just seen the miracles of God. Look where I live. Look at my children. I mean, Llewellyn's forever bringing me cake and sweets and they're cooking for me. And people in the church send me lovely curry and rice and biryani and all kinds of things. I don't need anything. So won't you take and a minute right now and just pray for the families, Mom, that it, are trusting God for what looks impossible, that God will give them the answer. Miracle. Of faith. We're looking yes. for miracle. Okay, then they must write it down. They must write it down now. Put the date, write it down on a piece of paper or in a notebook or whatever. So for those girls that are just trusting the Lord for husbands, they need to write down what they're looking for. Oh, my goodness me. <laughs> <laughs> you think we can get a perfect man, you know, like all of us dream about this perfect man that will come. But I promise you girls, don't worry about a perfect man because you're not perfect. Neither am I. So, all right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we love you. All we can say is all we've known all the years is your goodness, your love, your mercy, your grace. Thank you. And you know, Lord, that we are forever grateful, so grateful for having a heavenly Father just like you. Thank you for your miracles. Thank you for a heritage that we have knowing you because you said whatever you ask in my name and lord you tell us if we can ask and you'll give us a promise for whatever we ask for and so father we thank you for these beautiful people that are listening tonight some of them have lost their jobs at this time but lord you've got something better You've always got something better. Mm -hmm. you, we've got better homes. We've got e better opportunities. Only if we can see you in your miracle power of what you can do. And so each family, each family member, every boy, every girl, every child, we thank you, Lord. You've got a gift that you've put in them. Help us as mothers to build our homes. Help us as fathers to be the protection of the home. Thank you, Lord, for couples that learn to love one another and walk in the Holy Spirit together. So, Lord, we, we bring every family to you, and we know that you love the families. You were the one that created family. And so we bless you tonight for miracles, miracles that seem to mean impossible, but we know, Father, you said, our Father, and we thank you, Lord, that you are our Father. A wonderful, wonderful name to have a Father like you. So we bless your people tonight, Lord. We thank you that you will talk to the mothers and fathers and young people. You'll reveal yourself to them at this time. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Before we... We've still got a few minutes to go, Mom. I wanted to ask you, you know, during this season, we started out 2020 and people said, you know, that they said we've got to flatten the curve, COVID, we've got to flatten the curve. And then they extended the lockdowns and, and all of the rest of it. And so during this time, 
many people have suffered tremendous loss. Yeah, and, they have. And you've gone through, and so have I, uh, but I mean, you've been a role model for me in a lot of ways in dealing with, with grief and dealing with loss. And um, you always say to me, you know, we live in a, a, a human body and but the greater one lives in us how have you dealt with dad going to glory and <laughs> you still here to finish your your race and and run your course because he said he has plans for us you know yeah well you know uh, when dad was sick like that, he couldn't go to church. And I would go on a Sunday and I was riding back one Sunday and I was praying and I said, Lord, why haven't you healed my husband? I said, Fritz trusted you all these years and he's prayed for the sick. And, and why, why haven't you healed him? I said, he's never spoke, smoked, he's never drank. I've never heard your father say, I mean, I've never heard him say an unkind thing. He's always saying good things about people. I've never, he's never raised his voice to me in all the 63 years that we've been married. He would just keep quiet. And I remember going home and the Lord says to me, do you only love me because I give you miracles? Or do you love me? Because of who I am. Oh, Wendy. I had to examine my heart and I had to examine. Do I only love the Lord because he's giving me things? Or do I love him? It took me a week. You know, because when you're dealing with God, you've got to be absolutely honest. You can't have any little stories in the back room somewhere. You know. And I said, oh, Lord, you know, I don't know. And I took a week, and then one week later, I was able to say, well, Lord, if you're going to take him, then it's up to you. But I love you if you don't even give him a miracle. I love you. And, and I think that is what's helped me. I miss your father. I miss him terribly. Some days it's even worse than others. Like we're sitting in his study now. And all I know is him sitting where I'm sitting. He either got his Bible in front of him and he'll be sitting with his hands on his head. He'll be reading some book or other. And I would say to him, come on, come out here now. Let's sit out on the veranda and have a cup of tea. And he'd say to me, I'm coming. When I'm finished, I'm coming. And he would sit here for hours just being on his own and enjoying the presence of the Lord. And I think, you know, the most important thing for us is true worship. Mm. Worship to me is the most important thing. I said to the Lord the other day when I was praying, Lord, I don't have to be anywhere. I just want to be in your choir where we can just worship you day and night. To me, leading the singing on a Sunday was, and the worship songs we used to sing, and you have sing a lot of them, and you've got Grant at your piano there. He's a wonderful worshiper. And I admire him. Tell him I'm waiting for the CD. I'm going to be the one that gets his CD first. <laughs> But anyway, he's, when he's he's gonna he's gonna make sure that you get it. Yeah, I'm waiting. Tell him I'm waiting for him now. So anyway, when I'm gonna be 88 next month, and you know, all I can say, God's it, God. It doesn't change the fact that God heals the sick, and His oh, desire no. is to heal the sick. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, I don't even. I didn't even have a hesitation for one minute whether he yields or not. But I think it's, it's our attitude that God's really looking at it, our heart. You know, why? Why? You know, when you think somebody's suffering very badly 
And do you want to keep them in that agony or, or would you rather them be out the agony and be in the presence of the Lord? You know, you were there when dad was going over and he was telling us about heaven and all the rest of it. And um, of course, I mean, he is a healer. I mean, that's who he is. And, I mean, we've had many miracles of supernatural healing in the family. Yes. And, I mean, in the church, we've seen different people healed of all kinds of things. But I think that the important thing in us as a couple in a home with children and that it's our the way we treat each other, husband and wife, whether we talk nicely to each other and we teach our children how to respect each other, you now, know. Or, or, you, talk, you talked a little bit about worship, Mom. How would you define worship when you said you just want to be in, the, in God's choir? And I said to you before we went live on air, it's an interesting scripture and I'm looking at it where the Bible says we are seated with him in heavenly places. It doesn't say a heavenly place. So there must be more than one place. And so the realm of the spirit is so different to the natural realm. So worship takes you into that realm of the spirit, you know, the spirit realm. How would you define worship? That when you when you're in, how, you know, how would you define worship, and how do you understand worship? I mean, you've been around a you long gotta, time. You got to experience it, when you know. On a Saturday, Dad and I never went anywhere because Dad would be spending time in the study, and I would be being in the room and asking the Lord, you know, what songs. Should we sing? I never knew what your father was going to preach. And then I'd ask the Lord, you know, which songs to sing and things like that. And, and then he would tell me and then I would start singing and then the Lord would change the whole direction, you know. And I'll never forget one Sunday night, Pastor, you know, Pastor Johnny was like my right hand on that platform. I mean, he had a lovely voice, you know, like Becca said to me one Sunday after church. She said, Gwen, you know, your voice is warbling a whole lot now. <laughs> I said, I know. But um, we were singing a worship song. And I don't know what happened, but it was like you could sort of walk in to the presence of God. And I remember being on the platform and, and I can remember in myself, I was going to, I wanted to go and I wanted to push in, but I couldn't. It was like a big piece of plastic that I couldn't go any further. And when I opened my eyes, here everybody in the church was kneeling down, praying and worshiping. And you can talk to Johnny now and you ask him what happened that Sunday night. Because, you know, Sunday night's usually quite difficult. And um, when, I don't know, you know. So when you work, worship, you sing about who God is, not yeah. about how you feel. Or not telling him what he's like. You know, it's like I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice to worship you or open my eyes, Lord, that I can see you. And um, I mean, all those lovely old worship songs that we used to sing. And, you know, when I walked in your, I felt your presence. And I, I don't know, there were so many. Yeah. Yeah. And I used to get Pastor Johnny to sing that, that song on, sometimes on a Sunday morning as I walked in, I felt your presence. And it was, you know, making, not making, helping people to understand the presence of God, you know. I've come here not to hear a, a good sermon. People will remember what you preach. 
But people remember the worship more than what they do the preaching. Really, Mom? Because, you know, a lot of people say, well, uh, you've got to have, be an amazing preacher to grow a, a great church. But would you say it's, it's the worship that really grows the church? And the presence of the Lord. I mean, why do you go to the house of the Lord? You can put a tape on and listen to good preaching. You read a book, somebody's written, it's good preaching. But why do you go together? Why do we get together? What, what for what? That's People come mind. to worship. Yeah. They don't come for any other thing. And then you open the heavens because you're worshiping the Lord. So when the pastor gets up to speak the word of God, the people can receive it. Those worship leaders are more important in that service than sometimes the pastor is. They either open the heavens or otherwise nothing happens. You can sing lucky. Like, I mean, you can, I mean, you've got wonderful singers, you've got wonderful voices. But you get very few worshippers. Very few. That's my opinion. Listening to the music now, because I'll never forget, I was listening to TVN one day, or it must have been about 10 years ago, and a, a Satanist was talking to Jan and her husband. And he, this is what he said, and I never, ever forgot it. He said, you know what, we, as devil worshippers, have tried to get in the church all different ways, and we couldn't. And then one day, we decided we'll get into the churches with the singing. Mm. And I'll never forget that as long as I love so you know, when we, warfare. you know, um, when we were still in the embassy theater, once, one Sunday night after church, this man came with a lady and he said, I, 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 I come from the Satanist church. And he said, We've tried to get into this church. He said, but we can't. Because as soon as as soon as we come in here, you've got like weapons that stop us from coming in here. So he said, oh. And he said, Dad said to him, Well, what about Reinhard Bonke? I mean, he's got big tents and it. Oh no, he says, you just run and run and run around that. You can't get into those tent meetings. So, you know, we thought, oh, shame, you know, okay, this guy. We went to New Zealand, Wendy. Dad was preaching in a church in New Zealand. And um, he preached. And then there was a lady sitting in the front row. And he said to her, I want to pray for you. Dad pointed to her. Wendy, she left her seat and ran with all her might to grab hold of Dad. But the guys in that church quickly came and helped Dad. So afterwards, we talked to her and we said, said you know what? I said, my mother, my mother is the, the, the witch in New Zealand and I'm her daughter. Mm. And he said, I've come to see what you can do here in this church. So then dad, you know, prayed with her and tried to get her to say the sinner's prayer. She couldn't. Every time she tried to pray, she, she would choke in her throat. Oh. So, you know, the realm of the spirit is a whole different realm. It's not how much money you got or how big your church is or and all that, you know. It's whether you know the Lord. 
if you really know him. It's the most important thing. So you know, you we get, had so, sorry, mom. I'm we sorry. had so many people promise this money, you know. This one pastor comes from up in Joburg, and we would really trust in God to be able to pay the dome off. He came one Sunday morning after church and he said, Oh, you know what? I've got people in my church now, two men, and they found the, the jewels from Solomon and they're going to sell it. And Pastor Fred, when we get that money, we will pay the dome off. I looked at them and I said, thank you. That's very kind of you. I said, but don't make promises to us unless the money's in the bank. And the Lord would give us protection so many times of promises people would make, you know. And I guess they had good intentions. Right. But don't do it if you don't have it. You know, you say, well, I'm trusting the Lord. It's very easy to say that, but you've got to do it before you get the blessing. So my advice would be is write it down, put the date on there and say, okay, Lord, we're believing you for a miracle. This is what we want you to do. We're not telling you how to do it, but this is what we're believing you for it. And like you were saying earlier, you be the one to give. So people who who promise and their intentions are good, they want to promise thousands, but maybe they can only give a hundred. Rather yeah. give the hundred. Give the hundred. Yeah, give what you can. Yes. Amen. Amen. So even Amen. for people who are trusting God financially right now, give what you can give. And the yeah, but how much can you secret. handle? How much can God trust you with? Yes. You know, it's how much God, how much can, you know, when your children are small, how much can you trust them with? You're not going to give your little boy a thousand rand when he doesn't even know how to spend 10 rand. Yeah. You know, and so we've got to think logically. God's not an illogical person. And if he's a father, he wants to train us right. They don't train us wrong. And so in, in closing, Mom, one of the, the best ways that you've allowed the Lord to help you through, I think it's grief isn't a one-time experience. It's something that's ongoing, but the worship and worshiping God through it is what's for, for me, for me, uh, you know, I'll, I'll put music on at night till the early hours of the morning because this is me now. It's not for others. For me, okay, I'm praying. Then I'm praying, God, help Wendy. And then I'm praying the same thing, you know, for each one of my children. Now, if God, I think God didn't hear me the first time I prayed for you or last night when I prayed for you. So I'll rather lie there and just worship the Lord, find songs that worship him. For me, that's a comfort. Yes. That's a great comfort to me. But then the Lord can touch other people with other stuff. I don't know. But it's each one of our relationships with the Lord, I guess. You know, each one of us is so different and praise the Lord for that. And, you know, none of us are perfect. God's got a, his church is full of imperfect people. So don't go to church and look for perfect people because you're not going to get them. Yes, there's only one perfect one. It's Absolutely. Jesus. That's right. And that's why you can love one another is because you can help each other. And Psalm, because, you 20, know, Psalm 23 has been one of one of the favorite verses that I know that you've reminded me of is the uniqueness of shepherds, how the shepherd leads the sheep. And David wrote, and he said, he leads me 
into green pastures beside still waters. He restores my soul. And though I go through the valley of the shadow of death, you're with me. So there's a place of water. There's a place where he restores your soul. And worship is a place where he restores your soul because your heart starts to sing and yeah. your mind can be focused. Sometimes it's difficult to focus reading. I found reading aloud to myself helps me to focus my heart. And Llewellyn's been such an encouragement to me because he'll, he walks in the morning. He gets up at the crack of dawn and he walks and then he'll encourage me with the word and, you know, come on, when we've got to go for it. You know, God's word is true. You've got to know who you are in, in Christ Jesus. And that's uh, an, an encouragement. God puts people in our lives to yeah. encourage us so that when we're, we're not on our own. You know, so I know he walks into, into my house here yeah, and he looks at me and says, and what's the matter with you? I said, what are you talking about? Just look at your face. I can tell you right from your face there's something wrong with you. <laughs> I pray and cast the devil out. I said, <laughs> why must you always cast the devil out of your mother? Shame, but he doesn't mean it in the wrong way. I oh, know he loves you. I know I love him too. We have lots of loves. Me and Sylvia and him in the morning, they come and visit me. And I think that our conversation, <laughs> we, we can have such good laughs in the morning because Llewellyn's always up to nonsense, you know, full of jokes. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Thank you, Mom, for being with me tonight. Well, thank, thank you for you. inviting me. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you. And you're always such an encouragement to me and to my faith. And thank you to you and Sylvia for helping tonight mm. and yeah. doing the filming and, and everything. I Shame, I know. They, walk, they go and walk in the morning too and they're tired, you know. And I didn't want to worry them because Llewellyn Jr. is going to help John and Joy with their live stream. And I didn't want to worry them, but I'm your, glad you your, caught them. Your, your, lives, your, your live stream is more important. And so Lou and Sylvia said, we'll come and do it. <laughs> I love my daughter-in-law. I was so yeah. proud of her when she spoke. Yes, she did such an amazing I, job at Women's I know. Day. I know. I said to her, I said to her when she came, I said, well, if your father-in-law heard you, he would have said well, that was a good homespun word you gave today. Because <laughs> <laughs> so, I'd say you. to him, why don't you talk about marriage and all that? He said, I can't leave that to the woman. They've got all these stories about all this. <laughs> He knew about the prophets and the apostles. Oh, gosh. I know he used to, I, I used to wake up in the night and then he used to say, are you awake? And I say, yeah. He says, you know, when the Lord comes, you know, the book of Revelations, I prayed, I don't care if Jesus doesn't come. As long as I can sleep, I can come in the morning. <laughs> Shame. Thank anyway. you again, Mom. I appreciate Yeah, thank you, Sylvia. Thank, thank you, everyone Lou. that's that's watching and let's just pray as we close tonight. Father in Jesus name, thank you for your presence. Thank you for your power that heals and restores. I thank you that for every heart that is broken, for every person that is in a place of pain, emotionally, mentally, and physically, that your word says you are the great healer. You're the mm. wonderful restorer. Amen. You're the repairer of the breach and the restorer of places to dwell in. So we thank you for that miracle tonight that steps into each one of our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 So thank you again tonight for watching The War Room. And uh, I'll see you again next Wednesday at 7.30. I love you. Thank you, Mom. Love you too. Thank you. Uh, God bless. And happy birthday for the 16th of September. Yeah, you better come. <laughs> I love you. I love you, Wayne.